everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's session, we will be looking at a 2021 review of the year. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague, Robert Kelly. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just before we start the webinar today, I just wanted to go through a few um, ways that you can interact with the webinar today. So you're listening through your mic and speakers by default, but you can log in through the telephone. If you're having any connectivity issues, you just select the telephone option on your control panel uh, and, and that should allow you in. It is toll free. There's no cost apart from any local cost that may be charged through your telephone provider. Uh, we will be um, having a Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. So if you do have any questions, please use the question panel on your control panel to, to ask those. Uh, you can ask them at any point during the presentation, but uh, we will be holding the session at the end. Uh, we have also included some notes for today's session. I know people do like to follow along and use the notes. So if you look at the handout section of your control panel, the notes should be there. If you would like a copy of the notes and you're able to access them from the handout session, then, uh, section, then please get in touch with me and I'll be able to share a copy with you. Anyway, I appreciate we're running slightly late. So without further ado, I will pass on to Ian for the main part of the presentation. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Robert. Hello, everyone. I hope you're fine. What we're going to do this morning is have a review of the year. And if you wouldn't mind, what I'd also like to do is have a chat with Robert about uh, how he's seen things uh, on, from the perspective of Stuart Title for the current year and to have a look, look at uh, what's happening next year. So we'll have a little chat with Robert and Stephen, if that's all right, at the end of the session. Happy to take questions as we progress. We'll have some time for questions at the end. And as usual, do drop me a note if you have any questions or queries. I am about two weeks behind with regard to response at the moment, just because life is so busy. So what I thought I'd do today is sort of have a review of the year and sort of refresh ourselves about some of the issues and explain where we're at with some of the issues and to see if there's been any developments, any changes, any points of view that uh, are worth sort of discussing and disclosing. The first thing I want to mention today is uh, some issues with regard to state rent charges, because there's some debate and I have to an extent sort of uh, created a conversation about the stance to be taken when acting on behalf of a buyer where a developer is putting forward the state rent charges. So I thought what we'd do is spend a minute or two just having a look at where we're at and where what we've got. And I've also, since the last time we spoke about the state rent charges, done some further reviews relating to the law and relating to what people's stance and position is relating to them. The first thing, of course, to note is that with the demise of leasehold houses, we're going to see the rise of rent charges. We're going to see estate rent charges, obviously, because the traditional old-fashioned rent charge is being slowly but surely uh, eradicated from the conveyancing process, courtesy of the 77 Act. Estate rent charges are not disappearing, in fact, far from it. And the major problem with regard to estate rent charges that the government has huffed and puffed about but done so far nothing is the fact that leaseholders have protection in connection with service charges, but estate rent charge um, properties do not have the same protection, and therefore freeholders lack the protection that's made available to leaseholders. So what can we do? Well, the first thing to note is that uh, it's going to be highly unlikely that a developer is going to say to our client, Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith, yeah, we're quite happy to remove the provision relating to estate rent charges in connection with your property on the basis that your lawyer has raised some interesting and quite correct arguments that would suggest an estate rent charge is inappropriate. So I think we're having great difficulty in trying to negotiate out an estate rent charge on a development for two reasons. First of all, the um, estate rent charge is likely to be present in connection with previous transactions. Secondly, as a means of either ensuring compliance with positive covenant or reimbursement of expenses that are being incurred with regard to the management of a development, uh, estate rent charges are really the only solution from a developer's perspective. So I think to an extent we're stuck with them. So what can we do? Well, can we insert within our transfer provision relating to a requirement for the giving of notice relating to a demand for payment, 
a requirement for a procession of reminders with regard to arrears so that we're not going to get caught out. Remember, without those protections, if I can call it that, we are vulnerable to the fact that an estate rent charge might be due and owing, might be unpaid, and we could be immediately bounced into some very unfortunate enforcement action with some fairly nasty consequences. So if we can have some, some form of scheme whereby we are notified that the rent charge is owing, some form of reminder schedule with regard to uh, non-payment, then at least our client has a fighting chance of being able to pay whatever is due. The second thing that I see are practitioners attempting to exclude the operation of Section 121 of the Law Property Act 1925. And you may have recalled the fact that I've said in the past, I'm not so sure whether we can in fact exclude Section 121. And the point here is that there's no law that supports me or goes against me. As far as Section 121 is concerned, the original contracting parties, I think I can so with a degree of confidence, can exclude the operation of Section 121 and the courts would be willing to uh, enforce such a provision. But I'm not confident that where the rent charge owner and the rent charge payer are not the contracting parties, whether it's possible for the rent charge owner to be excluded from the relief that Section 121 generates on the basis of what was agreed in connection with the previous rent charge owner. So I'm not entirely convinced that excluding Section 121 is going to provide us with the long-term protection that will mean buyers of our property going forward are going to feel safe. So what could we do? Well, I've mentioned a number of things in the notes. Firstly, there is hope that at some stage the government's going to wake up. It's made some, right, some correct noises about protecting freeholders, but it's done nothing thus far. And therefore, there's hope that the government will statut uh, statutorily intervene and provide equal rights for freeholders uh, relating to opportunities to challenge estate rent charges and the requirement for reasonableness of estate rent charges, the requirement for demands and the requirement for reminders before enforcement action is taken. Interestingly, you know, in the past I've talked to you about ARMA, the Association of Residential Managing Agents. Well, the other day I was, as you do, sort of having a look at ARMA's website, and there's an interesting leaflet now produced by ARMA on uh, rent charges, which I would suggest is quite useful and it highlights the rent charge, oh, um, the buyer of rent charges, the rent charge payers' vulnerability with regard to enforcement action relating to non payment. I think the provision of that for our client would be sensible as well. The second thing that we can do, or sorry, the third thing that we can do, and again, I mentioned this in the notes, and this might be uh, a means of a sort of halfway house where we've got the developer's lawyers saying, no, we're not agreeing to any form of amendment to the estate rent charge to afford your client protection. No, we're not prepared to exclude the operation of section 121. Is there something that we can do with section 121 that prevents our client from the sort of doomsday scenario of the 1214 lease, section 121, subsection 4 lease that creates the problem? And what we could do, I think, is suggest that the transfer makes provision for the fact that if the rent charge owner uh, triggers 1214, and creates the lease of the property on trust as specified by section 121 subsection 4, then there is provision for the lease to be surrendered without a premium, provided the arrears are paid and provided the costs and court costs of creating and surrendering the lease are also paid. And we might, if we're really lucky, really cheeky, or we've got a nice developer that's willing to afford us this type of accommodation, have provision in which we cap the costs associated with the creation and surrender of that lease. So with regard to estate rent charges, what's my position as the year draws to an end? One, estate rent charges are with us. Two, the section 121 nightmare remains with us. 
as far as developers are concerned, unless they're prepared to adopt um, a reasonable approach from the start with regard to development and building in measures with regard to every sale, we're going to have a problem in agreeing particular terms with regard to the transfer of the plot or the property to our client. There are things that can be done. I am comfortable with excluding section one to one with regard to the parties that contract the original seller and buyer. I'm not as comfortable with regard to the position concerning subsequent owners, the rent charge payer and the rent charge owner. Not entirely comfortable that if I acquired rent charges, that what was agreed by the original creator of the rent charge will be binding on me where I've got freehold owners that are not paying the rent charge. That's my worry. Nothing in the sort of um, pipeline from what I can gather as far as government is concerned to balance up or level up using the government's, the government's terms the position of freeholders and leaseholders, unfortunately. Certainly no appetite as far as government is concerned to allow developers to sell leasehold houses, so we're not going to see leasehold houses all of a sudden uh, have some form of com comeback, nor are we likely to see a situation where common hold so it takes over completely and alleviates the problem. The next thing I want to talk about today are is an issue of co-ownership. So I've seen some case law that I'm sure you've seen that's quite interesting and again gen uh, generates and highlights some of the points that I've made to you in the past about co-ownership. The first thing I think that is important and that we can extract from case law is to make sure that we are forewarned and forearmed with regard to information from our co-owners. So if we are at on behalf of co-owners in a sort of domestic context, in a commercial context, we need information from our clients in order to provide the appropriate explanations and advice. And once again, I repeat the use of questionnaires. I would also maintain an argument that where our clients are involved in a sort of semi-commercial arrangement, that each completes their own questionnaire so that we have uh, confirmation that our co-owning clients, our co-owning commercial or quasi-commercial clients, are seen from the same hymn sheet. So if I've got a buy-to-let acquisition that's being undertaken by two brothers, then I'd want each to complete a co-ownership questionnaire independently so I can see that we are seen from the same hymn sheet as to what is to happen concerning the legal estate and the beneficial interest. The next point is to explain choice and the significance of choice. Then I think, and this is highlighted in particular by the case of Rowlands against Blades, the what if discussion, the horrible situation where the client is basically looking all embarrassed or the clients are looking all embarrassed and holding hands and telling us that they're not gonna fall out and that everything's absolutely rosy and you know, please don't embarrass us by talking about the dreadful circumstance where the relationship breaks down and we start having to talk about money. That what if discussion is important. It is important that it's recorded. It's important that you have clarified to the client what the position is, just in case the relationship does break down, just in case third world war is declared, in connection with the property and just in case one of the parties feels very aggrieved and decides to have a go at the conveyancer that advised them or more accurately failed to give advice. So this what if discussion I think requires a great deal of care and attention. So let's look at those principles and let's explore a bit of case law. In the notes I've given you the case of Ralph and Ralph decided this year interesting case father and son buying a property dad can't get a mortgage son can so son joins in the purchase and becomes party to the mortgage the only real commitment from son is the fact that he's in essence standing in the wings with regard to the mortgage if dad defaults then he's on the line he's not a guarantor he is a co-mortgagor 
So again, with regard to that, could I act for father and son? Can I act for son when in essence he is committing himself to a liability without theoretically any form of advantage if the property is held exclusively by father? If we have a situation where the property is being held by them both, should it be held as joint tenants or tenants in common? Explanation needs to be provided as to choice. It seems that there was a discussion, there seems that advice was given, it seems that the lawyer involved was sort of fully briefed as to the position. Unfortunately for all concerned, the Land Registry TR1 form was not correctly completed. And the wrong box in what was then box 11, which is now box 10, was ticked, indicating that the transferees were to hold the property on trust for themselves as tenants in common, in equal shares. And the interesting point here was, is that agreement binding? Is there an argument about common mistake? Well, common mistake was ventilated before the court, but the court was saying, well, hang on a minute, to establish mistake, we've got to establish that what was done was not what was intended. And unfortunately, we can't glean from the file or the evidence of the parties what was in fact intended with regard to this transaction. Again, that highlights a point that I bleat on about constantly, and I apologise for it, but again, had the lawyers identified object with regard to this transaction, that issue about, well, does the transfer actually record what was intended could have been answered. The second thing, the second interesting point about this case was that the transfer, in fact, was not signed by the sellers. And, and again, as far as that was concerned, that, you know, again, that meant that we didn't have a validly executed declaration of trust. So what's the position then? What do we do? Well, what the court did was raise a number of interesting arguments. In essence, the court was saying that is it possible for the sellers to hold the property on trust for father and son? and for the court to look at it and declare a beneficial interest on the basis of some form of constructive trust. Well, again, the court had a look at this, but decided there was no common intention of sole ownership in David's name. But looking at Stack and Dowden and looking at Jones and Kernett, the sort of famous family cases, could we argue that David was the sole beneficial owner? Emphasis being placed on the fact that Dean, the son, hadn't made any direct contributions to the purchase price, nor made any instalment payments with regard to the mortgage. The matter went on appeal and the court said, well, is it possible for us to rectify the deed to reveal what was intended? And you can imagine, again, the same problem. No evidence of common intent, so we're stuck. No evidence as to how the beneficial interest should be divided. Nothing actually agreed, nor, nor any evidence of intent. The decision of the Court of Appeal permitted Dean to have a 50% share in the beneficial interest, because that's what the transfer, in essence, said. Horrible case for a number of reasons. One, it's awful to see families at war. Secondly, awful to see that the conveyancer made a fundamental error of not having evidence of objective on behalf of these clients. Even more horrible on the basis that the transfer was incorrectly completed and not signed. It therefore uh, it's important to understand that when clients are signing documents, e even transfers, it's important that we understand the significance and the background of the transaction and make sure clients are aware of what they're signing. So 
as lawyers, we will give advice about co-ownership. We'll have co-ownership questionnaires. We'll have discussions, the horrible discussion, the what-if discussion, okay? But in this case, when the clients were faced with a transfer document, it wasn't simply an administrative task of ticking a box and leaving it at that. It was important for the clients to understand what that transfer was doing. And of course, it follows on from that, that the clients were aware of the need to read the transfer before they signed it. And of course, to make sure it was signed. The next case involves Roland and Blades. And this is quite an interesting case on the basis, if nothing else, of the parties buying a holiday house for about one and a half million pounds. So I'm tempted to think that one or both must have been an underwriter for Stuart's title to be able to afford a second home of that magnitude. The reality was that both lived in their own properties, both were fairly well to do. One of them wasn't an underwriter for Stuart title or indeed anyone else, but was a doctor. The idea was that this property would be bought as a holiday home to share at weekends and holidays, and that it was ultimately to be a retirement property. Very nice too was the crime. Dr. Rowland paid the entirety of the purchase price. He also paid all the costs. You sometimes work out how much SDLT is due on a one and a half million pound purchase. These scary amounts of money flying around. But anyway, it's paid for. And Dr. Rowland, on the time the property is being acquired, is quite happy, early 2009, for the property to be held in the joint names of himself and his partner, of the girlfriend, on the basis of a joint tenancy. The what if discussion seems to flow as a, a lot of them do. No, I'm quite happy. We're in love. We're happy. We're stable. Life's good. No danger of me disappearing off to the, in the sunset with anyone else. And I trust my partner 100%. So I'm entirely convinced she is of the same view. And you can imagine a great deal of nodding and a great deal of smiling during this conversation. And what happens? Our doctor friend forms a relationship with someone else. His former girlfriend is not particularly happy, not amazingly annoyed, surprisingly. So they're still moderately cordial. And the partner says, I don't want your new partner to come to our holiday house, our retirement home. I'm going to spend most of my time at that property. And the situation was that relationship number two of our doctor partner, client, breaks down and he then decides that he wants to start visiting the property again. So there's a bit of toing and froing with regard to who's occupying this property during the holiday periods. At some stage, there's a decision made that the property should be sold. And the court ordered the property should be sold and net proceeds of sale be divided equally. It seems that uh, the doctor wasn't that upset about that, seems sort of resigned to the fact that his generosity had uh, in essence come back to bite him but not too much of an argument a major argument however arising due to the fact that he's excluded from the property and an argument that he's entitled to sort of a notional rent on the basis that former partners in there enjoying this magnificent home and he can't the case is interesting because Although the main argument that was for the court to determine was the amount of rent, and there was quite a lengthy debate and lengthy argument either way on that point, the case I think is interesting and it shows the dangers of the what if discussion. Do we really drill down when talking to our clients and say, look, do you really understand what you're doing here? 
if this doctor was in your office or you were having a Zoom conversation with him or her this evening, are you happy for the conversation to go, you know, yeah, I understand, and yeah, I'm quite happy, and yeah, I'm going to buy it in my name, and let's put it in joint names. Remember what I said to you about case law, the fact that we should be advising a client, such as the doctor in this case, you do realise that this joint tenancy, as joint tenants in law and equity, could be severed, and therefore any sort of wish or hope or um, expectation that you're going to get your half share back due to the doctrine of survivorship could well and truly be scuppered. Interesting cases, interesting from a sort of social perspective, also interesting from a legal perspective, and again, just confirming the point that I frequently talk about in connection with being careful relating to co-ownership. Remember, we advise on joint tenancies, we advise about survivorship, we advise about severance. In advising on tenancies in common, we recommend declarations of trust. We remind our clients that declarations of trust need to be kept under review. And of course, these two cases highlight the fact that we do need to protect ourselves and our firm with regard to the need for extensive advice, particularly where circumstances are unusual. Both of these cases were unusual for slightly different reasons. The next thing I want to talk about is client inspection. And remember, I've discussed with you in the past the need to make sure clients understand they're bound by anything they see, they're bound by anything that they ought to have seen in inspecting the property pre-exchange, that we need to make sure our clients understand what overriding interests are. I have, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it or haven't heard me before, prepared a sort of client inspection checklist so that clients remember if they do spot something that's unusual with regard to overriding interest or other issues, report back to us to enable us then to give advice or to undertake further inquiry. Remember, a client should be inspecting before exchange to identify a physical state of the property. Clients should be inspecting the property to identify that the property is correctly uh, demarked by boundaries, that what we see when we inspect is consistent with what we read with regard to title information, contract, estate agent particulars, survey, valuation. Clients should inspect to check that the T information, the TA forms generated by the seller, is correct. At exchange, clients should be inspecting to identify state and condition. I had an email last week about this very point. Am I saying this is necessary for all transactions? I'm saying I would advise it, but I appreciate there are practicalities where this will not be possible. Where, however, a client is buying an empty property, a derelict property, a property that is vulnerable to damage, where sort of vandalism is rife, or where vandalism has occurred in the past or damage has occurred in the past, then I'd want my client to inspect an exchange of contract. Where client is living in Yeovil, buying a property in Leeds, I appreciate this may not be feasible. Where I was dealing with an at-risk property, I might ask the estate agent to go and check and if it was a valuable property where there was a real risk, I might ask that sort of photographs are taken so that my client has evidence of state and condition at exchange. Why am I being so sort of careful about this? Well, remember that if there's a material change in state and condition between exchange and completion, that may allow your client an opportunity, if you're acting for a buyer, to rescind. If you don't have evidence of state and condition, you're relying on the seller being very honest and conceding to you that damage has been occasioned to the property after exchange. And of course, the problem with that is if the property is empty, the seller's unlikely to know anyway. Remember I said that where we are concerned about a seller or a transaction, and we're not sure if a seller is taking their obligations with regard to the provision of vacant possession seriously, that the client inspects just before we complete, 
and remember the point that again is frequently um, overlooked that the buyer has a duty to the land registry to disclose any disclosable interest that exists at completion. So again, where your client is buying a property and not intent on moving in immediately, it might be worth mentioning to the client they should check the property out on the day of completion to see that the seller has moved out and just to check where there has been a hint or a, a, an argument that overriding interest might exist, what is seen on the day of completion. Remember, a buyer is under an obligation to disclose to the land registry using land registry form DI any overriding interests that are obvious on inspection at completion. Moving on, if I can, mines and minerals. Again, there's been some interesting case law about this. I don't know if you saw the Estates Gazette last week. An interesting case involving Wales and Mudstone, etc., and Mudstone not having any value, but nonetheless belonging to someone other than the surface title owner. Mines and minerals are not something that a residential conveyancer is going to encounter or be problematical in the normal run of things, but remember that where mines and minerals are accepted or excluded from a title, they belong to someone else. The fact that those mines and minerals are not registered at the land registry is irrelevant. And it is important to ascertain client objective where mines and minerals are accepted or excluded because where the client intends to undertake some form of subterranean activity, then there could be an actionable trespass. Interesting. Just uh, dealing with a matter that someone sent across to me last week uh, where the main issue was the construction of a uh, swimming pool or actually an enlargement of a swimming pool and an existing bathhouse. So there were showers and changing facilities in this building next to a swimming pool. And an argument arising from an uh, HMRC perspective as to whether this was uh, a dwelling. But the other issue was that where there was a plan for subterranean activity and mines and minerals were excluded, what would be the position if mines and minerals were um, uh, uh, damaged, removed, uh, uh, altered during excavation you know would that be an actionable trespass and the answer is yes and the other question that was put to me well you know what do we do in a situation such as that and again it's a point that I've made over the year where your client is buying a property there are searches that may be appropriate given client objective a geological search might be appropriate in this context and again, you're not expected to be a geological specialist or a geologist and give advice about what that survey reveals. But you should be advising the client that, look, we may be needing a geologist to confirm that the digging of a two meter trench to enlarge a swimming pool or to construct a swimming pool is or is not likely to trespass upon the mines and minerals that belong to a third party. Adverse possession. Again, I've given you some law relating to this, and I just want to make one or two points relating to adverse possession. The first point I want to make is that it is important to understand that where a trespasser can establish adverse possession that's historical. So if we can prove that we've been an adverse possessor, a trespasser, of registered land for a period of 12 years before the 13th of October 2003, so 14 years ago, then we can be a registered as proprietor of that land. It's important to understand, however, that where we can show and where we can't show adverse possession for a pool period of 12 years ending before the 13th of October 2003, we immediately can't rely on the old law under the Limitation Act, but are stuck with the Land Registration Act 2002, Schedule 6. The idea of the 2002 Act was to make adverse possession claims harder from the position of the trespasser. The idea was that the land registration system would then encourage owners of unregistered land to register to try and avoid the risk of adverse possession claims being made under the old regime. 
the idea was that adverse possession would become more balanced and more favourable to the landowner. In creating the Land Registration Act 2002, however, creating the regime specified in Schedule 6, what the Land Registry has done has presupposed two things. Firstly, that paper title owners, the owners of registered title, will keep addresses for service up to date. And secondly, that the paper title owner will immediately know that where they receive notification of an adverse possession claim, that they must spring into action, serve counter notice, and then proceed via the land registry process, which may culminate in contested hearings before a first tier tribunal. More on that in a moment or two. Remember that where a trespasser makes application and a counter notice is served by the paper title owner, then there are limited grounds for the trespasser to pursue in order to be successful. And what I want to do is, and I mentioned this at page 13 of the notes, is to talk about contested application that are made on the basis of the third condition set out in Schedule 6, where in essence there's a dispute as to boundary between neighbours. And the important point here is that the applicant has to show, in addition to a period of adverse possession, that he reasonably believed that the land to which the application related belonged to him. So how do we establish that reasonable belief? Well, our conveyancer might provide us with title plan description of property and report on title that confirms the relevant land is part of our property, part of our title. It might be that, in fact, the land in question is fenced off or hedged or some other way uh, divided between the paper title owner's other title and this parcel of land. There may be other reasons why the adverse possessor has this reasonable belief. The interesting thing is, what is the situation where the adverse possessor becomes aware that in fact the land doesn't belong to him? Does that automatically mean we can't rely on the third ground. And what I've done is given you some cases, Zarb against Parry, which is a 2011 case, and the more recent case of Dow's against City of Bradford uh, Metropolitan District Council. And the interesting point here is that it seems that from Dow's, we don't have to have boundaries between paper title owner and adverse possession or trespass, it doesn't have to be a common boundary. We simply need land that is adjacent to the land that is subject to the possessory title claim. The interesting thing about this case is that the position is still unclear, but it seems that what we, are, what we have to do is establish that we have to be justified in believing that the true position of the boundary that means that we're entitled to possessory title is where we believe it to be. What Dow's does is it limits the scope of the third limb of the possessory title claim that's made in contested circumstances. Interesting case, again, not entirely clear uh, that the law is sort of certain, but adding a degree of clarity, I think, is the, is the point that I would make. Land registration, just quickly, electronic signatures are becoming more and more prevalent. We have the Mercury signing protocol, which was prevalent during lockdown. We've now got digital mortgages and electronic signatures flowing from it. We've now got the land registry moving forward with the use of electronic signatures with a variety 
of different partners and platforms. The point I want to make is, despite all of these radical changes with regard to signatures, there are a number of rules that I think are still important. Firstly, that signatures need witnessing in, in the current state of play, although the land registry has a new system that potentially would remove the need for signatures. And we've got to be aware of property fraud and the risk of property fraud. And we've got to be aware of the risk of fraud, not just at the start of the transaction, but during the life of the transaction as well. So in the notes at page 20, I mentioned that qualified electronic signatures that the land registry are currently sort of working towards would not need a witness signature. So just be alive to that, be aware of it, and let's see what happens in 2022. Electronic signatures have their benefits, they generate vulnerability. There's no argument about that. I also mentioned local land charges. Again, just be aware that there are land, charge, uh, land charges being migrated from local authorities to the land registry. Three-year project from the land registry. Not many local authorities have migrated. If you look at the land registry, you can see a map which will tell you those authorities that have. The process will proceed at pace next year and the year after. The benefit of the land registry dealing with local land charges are significant. One, instant access to either a personal search, which is now undertaken online, or an official search. Secondly, a standard cost of £15 across the board. Thirdly, when an official search is requested and obtained, then that search can be refreshed for a period of six months without additional charge. The other point with regard to local land charges that are interesting is that local land charges in migrating local land charges from local authorities to the land registry are to an extent auditing local land charges. So hopefully the land registry data will be more accurate, up to date and less confusing than data that local authorities have. The other point to note is that the actual land charges themselves will still be retained by local authorities. Therefore, where inquiries are made with regard to what a local land charge reveals, you would need, still need to speak to the relevant authority or borough. But the land registry can give you a reference number with regard to what the document is and where the document is, and therefore the process should be a little simpler and a little swifter. Local land charges departments now not actually dealing with land charges searches, but dealing with requests for information flowing on from the search being obtained. Um, do be careful about clients that want you to proceed where you're proceeding without a mortgage, without a local land charges search. A local land charge is an overriding interest that will be binding on the client, whether or not a search is undertaken. Give me details relating to all of those matters at page 19, 20 of the notes, and 21 of the notes as well. Moving on, I'm conscious of time, some leasehold issues. Firstly, are you aware that there are new LPE 1s and 2s coming out, going live on the 11th of January? You can access them and see them. It's interesting because there are some new questions with regard to service of notice of email, receiving payments for information provided by landlords via bank transfers, questions about restrictions on keeping pets or parking. So there's sort of a change of emphasis, asking about fire safety or external firewall assessments, etc. So do familiarise yourself with those forms. It will be something I'll be looking at in the new year. So we might be doing a sort of a, a review about the use of these forms and the additional questions at some time in January 2022. Freehold management inquiries are also being altered. Additional questions relating to deeds of covenant, contributions to service charge and insurance. Ground rent bill sort of meandering along. Some important points here. Point number one, it will not be rest retrospective. So old leases with unreasonable ground rent provisions, ground rent review provisions, we're going to be stuck with. But new leases should not have any form of ground rent that generates reward as far as the owner 
uh, of the freehold or reversionary interest. It's also important to note that certain types of community-led housing leases will not be subject to the to the Act. Uh, financial products relating to mortgage payments, sort of Islamic finance, financing is not going to be caught, and business leases won't be caught either. So I've given you detail about that, just be aware of it. Fire safety and cladding, nothing really has dramatically altered. So I make some basic points here. EWS ones are not fire safety certificates. Always get specialist advice or advise your client to get specialist advice where fire safety is an issue. Where you're acting on behalf of a lender and there's a problem with regard to fire safety, the fire safety issue will have a valuation impact and therefore surveyor or valuer needs to be involved. Surveyor should be giving advice to lender about risk associated with fire safety impacting on valuation. Historical service charge data provided by a seller on assignment is not an indicator of what service charge will be going forward. As you can see when you read the volumes and volumes of articles about poor leaseholders that are now getting caught out with some fairly astronomic amounts of service charge being demanded in the current service charge year and I'm sure the same will apply going forward. Always remember that service charges are subject to a test of reasonableness. They must be reasonably incurred at a reasonable cost. So you always have a right to challenge where a landlord has incurred a cost relating to fire safety measures. Important to understand that we need to check service charge provisions in leases going forward to make sure that where we are hit with a problem of this nature and magnitude in the future, the service charge provision is better, better, um, better av available, better readiness to deal with unusual items of outlay. Therefore, reserve or sinking funds and the building up of a fighting fund for issues of this nature, or and the provision for a landlord to borrow money over a reasonable period so that the costs that are incurred in the current service charge year to generate fire safety measures are divided over the next 10 years or so rather than being the problem of current leaseholders. I mentioned in the notes that the issues are into forfeiture and again it's important Remember, you can't provide me as a client with a copy of the lease and say, read that in. There's an expectation that you will explain to me the terms within a residential lease. And where that residential lease contains forfeiture provisions, it's important that you drum home to me the fact that this isn't just some form of archaic nicety, that it is, in fact, a remedy available to landlords if I breach covenant. And again, I would always explain to clients that residential leases are on a fairly frequent basis being forfeited, generating a significant windfall for the landlord and terrible circumstances for the leaseholder and any lender. Next thing I mentioned, prescriptive easements and overriding interests. Remember this case that we talked about during the year? Uh, remember Tim uh, Talland coming along and giving us his view of the case of Hughes involving the Church of Frampton on Severn. This case and that conversation with Tim got me worried, to be honest with you, for a number of reasons. First of all, it's important that practitioners understand and appreciate that prescriptive easements can be registered because they're legal easements, potentially. But they're also overriding interest, courtesy of Schedule 3, Paragraph 3 of the Land Registration Act 2002. And you remember that when we examined this case, we discussed that the overriding status of the right of way could arise courtesy of three reasons, looking at Schedule 3, Paragraph 3 of the Land Registration Act 2002. An easement will be an overriding easement if at the time of disposition, the easement was in the actual knowledge of the respondent, the buyer. Hopefully, we can cover that off courtesy of client inspection. 
if our client inspects and undertakes a reasonable inspection, would did they have actual knowledge of the easement? Was the easement obvious on a reasonably careful inspection of the servient land? So this isn't actual knowledge, this is sort of constructive knowledge. Well, again, what does a reasonably careful inspection of the land involve? Remember, when we looked at this case, we had a situation where the right of way was used very occasionally. This was a quiet church in a quiet village where services did not take place every Sunday. They may have occurred in the past every fortnight. And the number of parishioners using the right of way to access the church was very, very small. And therefore, a reasonably careful inspection of the servient land would be unlikely to reveal the existence of this right of way. But then remember the third link. The easement would have been exercised in a period of one year ending with the day of the disposition. Well, here we're reliant on what the seller says to us, because we're not going to be aware of the easement being exercised in a period of a year ending with the day of disposition, the day of tr transfer, completion day. Because our inspection of the property is likely to be one event or perhaps at the best two or three events. So what do we do in these circumstances? So I'll just go back to this slide. I mentioned in the notes a number of things. I think what we've got to do is we've got to tell our clients to inspect and what they should be looking at when they inspect. The second thing that we should do is we should be more careful about having a look at the property our client is buying. I don't mean physically inspecting the property, but I mean looking at the title plan, looking at the agent's particulars, looking at the description of the property within the contract. And when we have a situation where part of the title is outside our boundary, as here, remember, you had a parcel of land that was part of the title that the buyer was acquiring, but was outside the boundary fence or boundary hedge, alarm bell should ring, and we perhaps should be making inquiries of the seller or neighbours to see, well, there is this parcel of land, has it been used by you or anyone else for whatever purpose? And remember, in this particular case, there was a track running along uh, of which this little parcel of land was part, and there was also a public footpath running along the same piece of land. So in those circumstances, as a reasonable conveyancer, should I be warning my client, look, there is a footpath, there is what appears to be a track heading towards a church, it might be that that track and that footpath are used for purposes to access that church. So the Public footpath is one thing, the track may be indi indicative of some form of use. The fact we don't see anyone using it, irrelevant. We place our buyer client on notice that there might be an issue. So remember the peculiarity of this case. One, we had land that was outside our fence, our garden, our boundaries. It was, in essence, an access road to our land that was also an access to the church. Then we had a public footpath running alongside and running along the track. And we also had evidence that this appeared to be a track. It was going somewhere. And therefore, all of those things, if we were acting for the buyers in this scenario, would warrant us warning the buyer client that there may be rights relating to that area of land that we are not aware of that our due diligence will not reveal, but which you will be bound by. I am conscious of time. So I want to finish today by not really giving you sleigh bells and sort of Christmas cheer, but an interesting case called Fairhurst and Woodard concerning doorbells. I smile when I see this case and I'll tell you why. My partner last year for Christmas for her, from her son, was given the dreaded ring doorbell. 
And I, being the dinosaur that I am, took one look at this piece of kit with the instructions and it's very easy assembly and thought this is far too technical for us. We better get the electrician in to have a look at it. Here we are nearly a year later. And whilst the electrician, electrician has been in the house on a regular number of occasions, doing lots of other things, the doorbell has been forgotten about. As a consequence of what I'm going to tell you, what I hope to tell my partner at some stage over the next few days, I'm not optimistic that the doorbell will ever be fitted. Oxfordshire, Oxford County Court, neighbours having an argument. Neighbours not full of Christmas cheer by the sound of things. Defendant installs a ring doorbell next to his front door. He also flipped fits a floodlight and a video and audio surveillance camera. The audio element of the camera is something the court certainly doesn't like. There is an integrated motion, mo motion center on the shed, a ring spotlight camera pointing down the driveway and a camera inside his front window sill. Very security conscious, has to be said. The claimant, was a neighbour and used to access her property by passing the front door of 87. The position was that the defendant, when challenged about these cameras, etc., had been particularly objectionable, claiming falsely that he was sort of acting in this sort of as a sort of community police officer telling the claimant he'd sent images that he got on his cameras to the police threatening to set up further cameras including concealed cameras and intimidating and threatening the claimant there were a number of issues before the court relating to harassment nuisance and breach of the data protection act the court listened to the fact that the cameras that were installed had quite extensive fields and depths. The microphones that were used were sensitive. De the devices were fitted such that they activated automatically uh, when people were walking past or when they heard noise. There'd been no real consultation with neighbours and there was no real confirmation from the de defendant at what he did with the videos and audio files that this equipment produced. During the trial, claimant seen as a sensible, reliable person. Defendant doesn't come out of this particularly well. Judge satisfied that the defendant's behavior crossed the boundary and was really oppressive and an acceptable conduct. The judge was satisfied that a reasonable person would say what the defendant was doing was alarming and amounting to harassment. The claimant and neighbours and visitors were subject to visual surveillance. And whilst overlooking one property from another wasn't nuisance, and that was the Tate Gallery case, remember, in 2020, the View case, <clears throat> nuisance perhaps couldn't be established, but harassment could, and breach of data protection could as well. So what does this mean? What should we do? Well, I think the safest thing to do is to warn clients that where they have a doorbell, a ring, door, a ring doorbell, where they have cameras or CCTV, but that's fine as long as the cameras are restricted to the property of the owner and nothing more. With regard to audio recording equipment, same principle. But the moment that we have doorbells, cameras, audio equipment that in essence goes on to public space, goes on to adjoining neighbor's property, then we are at risk of falling foul 
of the breach of the Data Protection Act 2018. I can hardly think that the vast majority of our clients, even the most annoying ones, are going to be quite as annoying as the defendant in this case. But I could see innocent uh, erection of doorbells, cameras, etc., for valid and legitimate reasons constituting harassment or breach of the Data Protection Act, and therefore clients need to be warned. On that note, I want to finish and thank you all very much indeed for listening. But before we finish today, what I'd like to do is to speak to Robert and Stephen. And first of all, to say to them, thank you on my behalf and on behalf of those that have attended these webinars, being a bit presumptuous in doing so, for organising these events. And Robert, what I'd like to do is say, to, ask you first of all, what have you seen this year with regard to your product, with regard to your clients and customers, and the sort of insurance market generally? And what do you see going forward for 2022? Thanks, Ian. Yes, well, I mean, like everyone attending this, we've been exceptionally busy this year. Um, and that's been yeah. right across the board from uh, bespoke policies on development cases, development sites which are starting to reopen now, uh, through to standard policies across residential transactions, and obviously a great deal of demand for policies that have helped to speed up transactions to enable uh, SDLT deadlines to be hit and so on. So that's been there. Um, yeah. We've also seen increased interest in Interestingly enough, in a number of the points you've raised today, so estate rent charges and uh, fraud, a lot of interest in those, uh, particularly people working remotely now to deal with fraud. Um, and as you say, ground rents, uh, the legislation that's creeping its way through Parliament isn't retrospective. So uh, we have seen a lot of demand yeah. for our ground rent policies there to protect lenders. Um, one of the, the good things, I think, is that all of this pressure on lawyers to uh, complete transactions has meant that a number now are looking at title insurance as a way to help their clients. Um, we've been very keen to stress, really, that title insurance is a solution, is not always the solution for a problem, yeah. but it does need to be considered. And I think that generally now the profession is slightly more amenable to title insurance. Uh, probably a yeah. sign of it is we're now being asked to uh, give some presentations and prepare work for people on IDD regulations uh, because right. lawyers are now stepping into that role of, of uh, selling insurance or promoting insurance. Yeah. Um, but possibly the best thing that we've seen this year, uh, I think, is that lawyers are no longer passive consumers of title insurance, we quite often now get inquiries from lawyers going, we have this problem, is there a policy or can you make a policy? And that's been yeah. right across from specific title risks to uh, issues like the Hackney data uh, problem where they got hacked early in the year. We've had people get in touch saying, can yeah. you produce a policy that just covers that? So. Uh, I think it's, it's a, a far more mature and uh, understanding audience now for title insurance, uh, which, you know, is one of our yeah. challenges for 2022 is to continue to find those products. And also, yes. we are spending uh, a, a lot of time now in making our online ordering system more intuitive to enable that, because that is obviously the quickest way for lawyers to get title insurance uh, in a residential transaction or a a standard commercial transaction because they can go online and get a policy within 90 seconds. So we're investing a lot and people will see some updates on that early in the new year to try and make that more intuitive and enable more work to be done online. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Robert, the, the, the point you made there I think is really useful for, for practitioners. You know, sometimes uh, you're sort of sitting with a problem on your desk and, uh, you know, particularly if you're working from home or with colleagues who are so busy, you know, difficult to sort of have a sounding board. And whilst, you know, obviously you're there as insurers, if there is something that's unusual where perhaps there isn't a sort of standard policy that immediately sort of flashes up with regard to the problem, talking to the likes of your good self and your colleagues at Stuart Title 
can uh, often sort of uh, decide on a route to take or gives you the opportunity to create a bespoke policy or may uh, send the conveyancer down an entirely different route. But I think the idea that there is flexibility and a willingness to look at you know, what the market requires and see if product can be created is a good thing from your perspective, but also a good thing from the perspective of conveyancers. And I think the idea that you know bespoke policies can be created are being created for unusual sets of circumstances, and often a situation that you think is unique to you and unique unique to your particular problem might be something that you, Robert, and your colleagues have encountered before, and there might be product that's sort of in the pipeline there that fits the bill, or if you're bombarded with requests for a particular product. It's lovely to see that you're prepared to see what the market wants and to see if we can help by creating new product. So thanks for that, Robert. Anything else to add, Stephen? Uh, I think just for me, I, I've I've been really proud of the um, just very quickly on on Stuart of the of the progress. Robert mentioned it on the online system and the integration we have. Obviously, there is a lot of pressure. There has been a lot of pressure on the market this year to turn things around quickly. So we've really put a lot of time into developing our, our integration piece, which actually allows our online platform to sit on a, a conveyances case management system so they don't need to come out of that or um, right. or log in elsewhere. And also working with search firms, just any anything we can really do to just using the technology to expedite that process. So I've, I've been really pleased with how we've uh, sort of moved forward with that and, and will continue to do so um in the new year uh, so yeah yeah good well thank you everyone uh thank you for listening everyone Stephen. i'm i'm not sure if there are any questions arising today i'm conscious of time if there are think... questions would it be sensible if you could just send them across to me and i'll have a look at them can do i think we'll, we'll um we'll, we'll field a, a couple of questions there have been a couple that came in quite early yes. so i think they're quite quick to to answer, I think yeah. Ian says thank you to everyone. Apologies for the start as well today, but thank you for everyone for staying on and for staying on to the, the Q and A session here as well. Um, there will be a recording of this webinar, so if you do need to to head off, I appreciate we are overrunning by fifteen minutes, so you can access that through the recording, which will be sent out in the next couple of days. Um, so yeah. yeah, if I just move to a couple of these questions, Ian. Um, one from Mayumi. Um, Mayumi says, Ian mentioned about the ARLA's useful notes on the rent charges. Please, could you direct us to a link page for the same? So perhaps we could put that in the follow-up as well. Yeah, I'll make a note of that. Yeah, fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, right at the start, yeah. you spoke about the case um, Taylor & Taylor, I think, uh, with the, the TR1 form. So uh, Mark Cairns asked, TR1 not signed by the sellers. How did the transfer get registered then in that instance? Yeah, well, you can't. That, that's the interesting thing, Mark. It, it, the land registry will register if it's just executed by the sellers. You think the requisition and say, "Hang on a minute," there's a, you know, the, the TA10 or TA11 has been completed. Therefore, uh, we want the document signing. In this case, it wasn't picked up by the land registry. They just registered it. Excellent. Thank you, Ian. Um, and yet, yeah, there's a, a a final question here from. From Debbie, she asks, uh, would it work getting a deed of variation stroke rectification executed to exclude section 121 LPA 1925 if the original parties agreed to the parties to the deed as well? Uh, I think it, w I mean, I'm still uncomfortable, but remember, all that's expected of you is to do that which a reasonable conveyancer would do. And I think a reasonable conveyancer would adopt the approach that Debbie's, Debbie's mentioned. I think I am being very cautious, but what worries me, and no matter what anyone says to me, it continues to worry me, is the fact that the original parties exclude the operation of one to one I become the rent charge owner. I acquire the rent charge going forward. The rent charge payer doesn't pay. I fail to see how, just because my predecessor uh, agreed that section 121 wouldn't apply, that 121 wouldn't apply if I tried to enforce. Now, as I said, there's no case law to support my argument, it's just my sort of view. That it, it, I am hopeful that at some stage 
that the government is going to grab the nettle and say, right, we're going to afford freeholders the same rights as leaseholders with regard to a state rent charge. But to act, ask, answer Den, uh, Debbie's question, yeah, I think that's the same thing to do. I'm not going to object to it. I'm going to ch or challenge it. All I would say is I would be warning uh, a, cli a buyer client about just how draconian a state rent charges are, how draconian Section 121 is, and whilst we've attempted to provide the client with protection, we're not entirely convinced that that protection is complete. But good question from Debbie. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Ian, for answering that. Um, just one very final question that's coming from, from Linda, so we will take that. Uh, Linda Ross, regarding yeah. the mines and minerals where the property register yeah. refers to the yeah. accepting and reserving of the mines and minerals to the, ven uh, yeah. to the vendors, should we be raising specific inquiries of the seller solicitors? Um, I would only do that if my client was intending to undertake some form of subterranean activity. So if you know that your client is building a swimming pool or you know that your client has a large cellar that they're hoping to extend, et cetera, then I would start asking the seller about it. If I'm not aware of that, if nothing's been said to me that, there, that would suggest there's any form of subtraining activity intended by the buyer, I don't think it's necessary. I think you're simply going to advise the client that mines and minerals are accepted. And therefore, if the client does intend to undertake any subterranean activity, there is a risk. That the client commits trespass by um, in, by infringing the rights of the mineral owner. Just because the min mines and mineral rights are not registered doesn't mean they don't belong to someone. There's no compulsory obligation to register mines and minerals in order for those rights to be enforceable. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Ian, and thanks, Linda. Good question from Linda. I thanks for that. Yeah. I think we'll learn, we'll um, Stephen, next year. You know. Oh, sorry. Come on. Yeah, no, sorry, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, what I was going to say is, you know, if mines and minerals are a real issue for people, I, I hope they're not. But if they are, then it's something that perhaps we can have a look at next year, because I've done a lot of work relating to mines and minerals in the past with regard to commercial activity rather than resi, resi activities. But if it is something that resi, residential conveyors are really concerned about, we can provide a lot more detail relating to issues associated with mines and minerals next year. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It's, it's only anecdotal, but seeing the amount of inquiries we get uh, with regards to, to mine and, mines and minerals issues, I, I think that would actually be quite a, a popular webinar. So we can certainly look yeah. into that. Um, yeah. So, okay, I think we'll we'll um, we'll wrap up there for today. But uh, that just leaves me to say thank you to to Ian and, and Fred from for attending today's webinar, and to all of you that have attended them throughout the year. Um, I hope you have enjoyed them and they have been informative to you. If you do have any other questions, please do contact Ian, Robert or myself. Once you leave today's webinar, as per usual, you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar. If you respond to this email, the replies will come directly to me and I can either try and field any questions or send feedback or questions on to Ian and Robert. You will also receive a separate email from Robert, which will contain the slides and notes for today's session and a link to the recording as well. That just leaves me to say, on behalf of Stuart Title, IQ Training and Ian Quayle, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>